Hi, how's it going? Uh, I'm CJ Jenkins. I'm the head of data at Devo Team Creative Tech. Uh, we're a consulting firm in Sweden. Um, and today, I'm going to be talking about five ways to fail at machine learning. So I think this is the least controversial like, slide you guys are going to see the whole time, uh, that AI is the future. I'm pretty sure that's why all of us are here. Um, but what is a little bit more controversial is that despite the fact that AI is the future and we should all buy in, currently about 80% of machine learning projects that you start fail to make it into production. So we have a lot of time, a lot of effort, uh, a lot of people, and a lot of money that's moving towards making AI and machine learning part of your product, um, and the majority of them, the vast majority of them, uh, are never seen in the light of day. And there are a number of reasons why this is the case, right? Like anybody who's ever done data science can tell you there's all sorts of different ways that they fail. Um, but when I was asked to give this talk by Data IQ, uh, I was like, you know, let's, how should we do this? And I was like, I'm gonna focus on five specific ways, like rules you could use to make sure that your project doesn't fail. And then, because I like humiliating myself in front of a room full of people, uh, I'm gonna give you five ways in which we broke that rule at some point in my career uh, and how the project failed. I think it's best to give examples when you're talking about uh, specific rules. Cool. So, the title of this talk should actually be five ways that I have failed at machine learning. Um, and I, yeah, just gonna go straight for that. We'll see how it goes. Great. So. These are the five rules. I'm not going to spend too much time on them because I'm going to spend the next mm, 18 and a half minutes talking about them. Uh, but the first one I think is the most important and it's the one that often gets overlooked most in product organization is that you really need to know your product, right? So building a data product or a machine learning algorithm uh, or a dashboard or whatever um, is not going to be worth it unless you put the product and the product team first. And I've seen this happen so many times uh, at different places, but my personal favorite was when I was at N26. We built this really cool machine learning algorithm to like, show you where each of your transactions took place, right? And we're like, wouldn't it be great if you went into the transaction view and you could see exactly on the map where you did that transaction? And we integrated it with open maps because it was cheap and we had a pretty good hacky solution and we had this all set up and we're like, this is fantastic. And we did all of this without asking the product team if they wanted it? And the answer was no. It, when we finally brought it up to the product team, they were like, we can't see how this adds a lot of value to the customer experience. And when we mentioned you had to integrate it with Google Maps, they were like, that's really expensive. And the cost was never gonna offset the gain, even though if it was marginal gain, to the users. And so rather than building a machine learning algorithm that you think is really, really cool, and saying, if I build it, they will come, Instead, get to know your product team, learn your product team, think about how the data that they are collecting can better help their product, and then build that machine learning algorithm. And I know that sounds really obvious, but it's honestly still the biggest mistake I see most data science projects doing, is not asking what the product needs first before something that you think is really cool. All right, number two, know your data. Uh, this is the second biggest mistake I see most people making. So I think a lot of people have the understanding, they're like, oh, once you get into data, you can just take a ton of data and you throw it into the algorithm and magic is gonna come out. And unfortunately, that is not the way that it works most of the time. You need to get an understanding of what data you have, what the distributions are, what the factors are, what the categories are. Talk to the product people. They are the experts. They know what the data is supposed to represent. Um, but if you don't do this, you're often gonna end up with a machine learning algorithm that doesn't do what you want it to do and you won't really have a good idea why. So again, back to N26, this was a mistake that every single person on the team made, so I don't have to just own up to my own mistake, um, is that everybody looked at our base of customers and were like, we've got all of this transaction data, right? N26 is a mobile bank, and we're like, we know so much about our customers. We know how they spend, we know what they buy, we know where they shop, we know all sorts of demographics. This is gonna be a fantastic, we can cluster our users, right? And from there, you can then have targeted advertising to those users, right? You can see who's the youths are, so we probably shouldn't try to sell our premium product and who the big spenders are and all this. We're like, this is great. And every single person from the data intern up to the CDO tried this. But the truth is, is that the way people spend their money is not that different from each other, right? Everybody spends their money on food, shopping, rent, bills, the occasional big purchase, but the way that people spend their money is all the same. And so there is no difference and there are no clusters to find 
but every single person on the team had to verify this for themselves. So we finally just started letting people do it. When new people would show up, they'd be like, you know what we should try is clustering, but like, you really should try that. Go right ahead. <laughs> we'll see you in a few days. Let us know how it goes. But like, everyone was so determined, and the answer was always going to be the same. Um, so you really have to get an understanding of like, what your data looks like before you get too far. So don't go too far down the rabbit hole. Um, before you build a model pipeline or you invest in like, you know, building a dashboard or you put a lot of effort into it, take a step back and spend some time doing the exploratory data analysis. Learn about the features. Think about what features might be important. Talk to your product team and really try to be more data centric. And then ultimately, when it comes to going down that rabbit hole of the model pipeline, you're going to be a lot better off. All right, number three, learn to love cleaning data. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I talked to a lot of master's students. I have a lot of master's students and a lot of young people on my team. Uh, and they all come out and they're all baffled by real world data and how it is not very clean. Um, they're like, why are there all these missing values? And they're like, what do you mean this variable has no like, meaningful, you know, <laughs> has no value in the, my model? I'm like, well, that's the way it works. Um, so this is one of those lessons that takes a while to learn, um, but one that I had to learn quite a bit <laughs> when I was working at Klarna. Uh, so when I was at Klarna, I was within the shopping app, uh, and we, the shopping app is, gives you the ability to shop basically anywhere on the internet by creating a virtual card, right? So you have two steps in this process. You have, when we create the virtual card, you put in which test store you're going to use it at, and then at the point of transaction, we collected data from Visa that told us where you actually shopped, right? And the goal was to prevent people from, um, from abuse or from first-party fraud, so people who are using the card not the way that we intended it to. And everybody came to me and they're like, one of the things you should do is check the merchant name, right? At the point where the card is created and the point where the card is used, check the merchant name. And I was like, here's the thing. Merchant name is a string variable. And let me tell you from Visa, it is incredibly messy data, right? So there are, I counted at one point, 68 different ways we could identify to say Amazon. And that was just one of many merchants. There's also dozens of different ways to say Walmart, and this is all just within one variable, right? This is just merchant name. So if we had tried to do just a one-to-one -one mapping of the, where the card was created and where the card was used, our biggest merchants would have never matched up. So this was a problem. So what we did is we uh, used mapping for the commonly used phrases for big merchants so that we were searching that string specifically for those ones, and then binned all of those into one merchant name so that it then actually looked like Amazon or like Walmart uh, or like Nike, our bigger merchants. We then looked at the long tail, and we're like, you have so many different possible merchant names, because you can essentially use this card anywhere on the internet, right? And everybody was like, oh, it should be easy to just match them. And I was like, yeah, but we don't really care about the long tail, right? Like, you're not going to have a lot of return on your investment if I'm doing this for every single possible merchant on the internet. But if you focus on the left skewed merchant, you're going to get about 80% of your use cases, right? So we took this situation where everyone was like, it should be really easy. I was like, it was not easy. But eventually we got there that you're able to take this really messy data and make something a little bit cleaner. But only because you know that data is messy and that you're going to have to clean it. So don't just throw data into a model and hope for the best. Instead, you should check for the quality, check for the missing values, look at skew, think about imputation, um, check your text variables. They're always going to be messy in my experience. Um, there's going to be duplicates, there's going to be junk, there's going to be things in there, and you want to find it and get rid of it. And I think one of the things I wanted to emphasize on this as well is that a lot of people tend to despair if they're younger. They look at this and they're like, this data is super messy, we can never build a machine learning algorithm out of it. I was like, mm, <laughs> let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Like, you, there are things that you can do, and there are a lot of people who spend time just figuring out how to fix messy data to make it so that you can build data products. So that's my rule number three. Number four, simple is better than complex. Um, again, I work with a lot of students, uh, and they all come to me and they're like, I want to build neural networks. I'm going to get really deep into deep learning. I think it is the coolest thing. And I was like, that's fantastic. Just so you know, about 90% of machine learning algorithms are not using deep learning models. And they're like, OK. <laughs> so like, we have to take a step back. But I did have a manager who was a big network guy, right? Um, and so when I was at Klarna, one of the teams uh, was working on algorithms to predict whether borrowers were going to get paid back or not, right? So whenever Klarna gave a loan, they were like, are we going to get this money back, yes or no? Binary classification. It's pretty simple. Uh, we had a lot of data that went into it. We had a ton of, like, a really good pipeline the whole way through. 
Um, but this is a pretty qu simple question. Are we going to get paid back or not? And I lost a bet to my manager, which means you shouldn't make bets with your manager who's really into neural networks. So I had to try both of them. So I tried both a neural network and a gradient boosted tree algorithm. And I deployed both of them to the shadow environment. So they were running in production, um, but neither of them were making any decisions. They were just saving the decisions to a database. So we could verify which one was better. Uh, and it turned out that the gradient boosted tree algorithm was better across every single metric. And it took me deploying it into shadow to demonstrate to him that it was better across every metric. Like it was more accurate. It took less training time, it had a way better SLA, and we had a really, really, really tight window in which we needed to return the value for the prediction. Um, so overall, even though like the neural network with a lot of tweaking and a lot of effort and a lot of training might be better in some situations, and there are those situations, most of the time, if you start with something simpler, even as like a baseline and then build up, you're gonna be much better off than if you immediately jump to something new and shiny. So don't just jump at the latest and greatest advancement. Um, you might waste time and effort and a lot of computational resources, because neural networks are pretty expensive to train, going too far down the wrong path. Um, instead, we always like to try a simple solution first. Like, do you need machine learning? Will a few rules get you a little bit you know, far the way? Um, was a little linear regression work or a logistic regression in the case, because we were doing binary classification? A gradient boosted tree. Like, Start simple, and then you can start building off of that and be like, okay, this is our baseline. Can we build off of this? Can we make it better? But having that baseline out into production will have you save a lot of cost um, and a lot of training and development time to just get that out the door first. So can you use a sword to cut a sandwich? You absolutely can. Do you need to? Probably not. Um, so this is what I always like to tell my students when they're like, I think I should use a neural network. And it's like, Take a step back. <laughs> Great, last one. Uh, perfection is the enemy of finished. And I think this is true across software development um, in most fields, but, and there is a balance, right? So you need good enough uh, that it's not gonna cause problems, especially down the road, right? Like in the example at the beginning, we made a really hacky workaround and it was never gonna be good enough down the road, right? Uh, but it doesn't need to be perfect, it needs to be finished, right? It needs to be out the door so that you can test it on production data. And if you don't ever get it to out the door to test it on production data, you don't actually know how it's working, right? Um, and so at N26, uh, we, we were a bank, we lent money, right? Um, and it was based on your salary minus a number of other variables, right? So we had this categorizer that was identifying salary and bills and your other expenses, and that determined the amount of the loan, right? It was a pretty simple classification algorithm. It was really cute. Um, the team ended up really liking it eventually, but the developer who was working on it got really tied down in the details of perfection, right? So it was 18 months to deploy the working machine algorithm to anything resembling production, but the project itself was finished in six months. And so they waited about a year for them to be ready to deploy the machine learning algorithm, and that's to even verify that it's finished. And it's because the developer kept going back and being like, no, we need more training data. He's like, we need more labeled training data that's really high quality, so he spent tons of time labeling data. And then he's like, wait, this doesn't have the latest and greatest code, we need to refactor it again and again and again. And he had the best of intentions, but more than once I was like, we should probably just put what we have in production and see if it works the way we think it does. Because your production data isn't always gonna look like your training and testing data, and you're not gonna know that until you get it in production, even if it's just running in shadow and collecting and determining whether or not it's right. So don't keep pushing marginal improvements. Uh, I always say this to my junior data scientists, I was like, become a finisher. <laughs> like, become somebody who is finishing things and putting them out the door. Even if it, once it's out the door, you go back and you iterate on it and you make small incremental uh, improvements then, you need to have that production, you need to have it out the door, uh, you need to have an understanding of how it's gonna perform in the real world before you can make any of those iterations. Okay, so these are the five rules and the ways that I've broken each one of them <laughs> over the course of my career. Just give it a moment. Uh, and then I wanna give you the TLDR version um, so that <laughs> if you fell asleep and just woke up, uh, what we like to really focus on in these, for all five of these rules, is having impactful data science, right? Like I think uh, we've all seen the Venn diagram. Uh, there was one I think in the last talk where it's like data science exists at the corner of analytics and coding and domain knowledge, and that's true. 
But also I think that impactful data science needs to exist in the integration or the intersection of what's possible, what's desirable within your company, and what's profitable. And if you start a data science project and you're not thinking about those three things, then you're not really gonna have as much of a chance of having an impactful data science project that won't fail uh, to make it into production. Cool. And with that, I will ask questions. First of all, thank you very much for that talk. That was excellent. I was just interested in the first point you make, which is about listening to the product teams. And where do you strike the balance? Because to sort of go, I don't know whether it's true or not, but the quote by Henry Ford, which was, if I relied on focus groups and asking people what they wanted, they would have said, a faster horse. <laughs> so how do you then sort of push the button and say, well, actually, yeah, I know you might want this, but there are, are better things, but then you don't want to go too far to then sort of over-engineer the problem. So like, how do you strike that balance? For me, it became like, I, I'm gonna try to answer this question, but I'm not 100% sure I understand it. Um, for me, it became like really getting a good relationship with the product owners and then demonstrating to them and being like, hey, this is what it can do. And again, like giving examples, like, hey, this is what I think it can do, like here's what we wanna try, here's where it can add value, right? Like keep referring back to, if it's a you know, customer-facing product, be like, this is how it's going to improve uh, your product, this is how it's gonna improve your KPIs, like getting back to the business value. And then it's going to be hard to not, for them not to agree, like, you're right, we do need this, right? Um, but it's also important to, like, you know, <laughs> they say kill your babies. Like, there have been more than one time where I was, like, I tried something and I was, like, all right, this is going to be really cool. And then I got towards and I was, like, you know what, this isn't going to work at all. Uh, and then by being open with them and being, like, hey, I don't think this is actually going to work. They're, like, cool. And we, they've now, I've, we have a better trust relationship. And so the next time I come to them and be, like, actually, I think this might work as well, they know that I'm not... If I uh, interpret that, it's like saying, would it be cool if we could invent this for you? It might not work, but do you mind if we have a go sort of thing? Okay, exactly. well, that's great. That's exactly. Because I think a lot of people get the, or a lot of people I've worked with get the understanding that they're like, data is magic. And I was like, nope. <laughs> I say that, like, I walk around my company with, like, machine learning is not magic shirt wearing. Um, but, yeah, as long as you're, like, really open and really clear, uh, then I think it tends to work out better. Thank you very much. And thanks mm -hmm. again for the talk. Yeah, no worries. my voice, but I have a lot more. Go for it. <laughs> so, first of all, these are one of the best looking slides I've ever seen in a machine learning talk, so thank you very much. Thank you. Now, the second thing is, uh, I'm really curious about the KPIs that Twitter is going to start with. Mm -hmm. I don't want them to really go through this rabbit hole and completely the experimentation side. Mm -hmm. I want them to go straight into production. So, what are kind of the KPIs? How do you organize them? How do you it make sure this is what yeah, that's a good question, and it depends entirely on the team. So at the moment, um, I'm at a consulting firm, and so each project has its own KPIs, and we like to focus on KPIs. So we have three for each project. We have one that focuses on the business case, one that focuses on the customers, and one that focuses on the developers, so that everybody on the team feels like they're integrated and they're working towards the KPIs. And so I like to tell my people who are with, embedded within each of the product teams, like, if you are working on something that doesn't affect one of those three metrics, you're working on the wrong thing. Right? So like if they're pushing a feature where they're like, I really think that this would be cool, and I was like, great, it doesn't affect their KPIs, it's not actually going to help their product, so we need to shift to something else. So that's generally how I'm helping them figure it out. Um, but you're right, in terms of like measuring performance, it's a moving target, right? Because I'm like, I'm not going to measure you by the number of machine learning algorithms you've tried or the number of things you're going to put in production. Um, I'm measuring you more based on like the younger data scientists, how they're trying the more senior data scientists, like how well that they're able to integrate within the product team and how well they're pushing the product forward and the data product forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I'm around if anybody wants to talk after this.